Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for gathering with us here this morning at First Baptist Church, Grove City. Uh, if you have your Bibles, follow along with me as we read from the Word of the Lord, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in those last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised you from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. In 1906, in a small village outside of Cologne, Germany, a young man was born to a middle-class Protestant family. There wasn't very much any really special about this child, but he would go on to impact the world in a very powerful way. After failing to complete his engineering studies, this young man by the name of Adolf Eichmann had various jobs, including working as a laborer in his father's small mining company, working in sales for an electrical company, and he even traveled as a salesman for an American oil company. In 1932, though, things would take a drastic change in his life. He had been teased and harassed as a young man, and at the age of 26, he joined the Austrian Nazi party on a suggestion from his friend. Eichmann would join the Nazi party and soon he would become a member of the SS and as a member of that special service he would move up in the ranks, ending up at a concentration camp in Dachau, Germany. In 1934, a few years later, he found himself tired of the monotony at the concentration camp and he was assigned to a different position where he became fear in, just empowered to get rid of the Jews out of, Amer out of Germany. He gained the attention of a gentleman by the name of Heinrich Himmler who was in charge of the SS and Eichmann would be moved up slowly and be appointed to what was called the Scientific Museum of Jewish Affairs. In 1938, the Nazis took over Austria, and in that time, Eichmann was sent to Vienna where he established a central office for Jewish immigration. The sole idea behind this office was to get as many Jews out of the country as quick as possible. And he did so by charging them basically all of their wealth to give them papers and passports to get out of the country. Almost 100,000 Austrian Jews managed to leave in that time frame that he was there. And in overall view from the Nazi party, what Eichmann did was so looked on with success that they opened up two other buildings such the same in Prague and in Berlin. In 1939, Eichmann would be sent from Vienna back to Berlin where he would be appointed ahead of the Gestapo section for in the new right main office. He would now be responsible for the implementation, implementation of the Nazi policy towards Jews in Germany and all the occupied territories, which by that time was growing to include, include most of Europe, or parts of Europe and parts of the Soviet Union. In 1942, Eichmann organized a conference just outside of Berlin with some higher-ups in the German Nazi party along with bureaucrats from inside the party 
and he planned the extermination of the entire Jewish population of Europe and the Soviet Union, and an estimated 11 million people. At that conference, they were said to have said that Europe would be calmed of Jews from east to west. By this time, Eichmann had moved up to lieutenant colonel, and his sole purpose now was to implement the final solution of the German Nazi party. In August 1944, Eichmann reported to Himmler that approximately 4 million Jews had died in death camps, and an estimated 2 million more killed by mobile units traveling around. He was said in an interview, or they have a recording of him talking to another uh, Nazi higher up, and he said that in that conversation, if he would have been able to kill 10 and a half million Jews, he would have been okay with those numbers, because that would have put him close to their goal of the 11 million they wanted to eliminate. But the 6 million just didn't quite get where they wanted to. Today our passage lays out for us things that we need to do to take into account to live a truly holy life. And you may wonder, Josh, what in the world does this have to do with Albert Adolf Eichmann? And we'll get to that. But Peter gives us the guidelines to what I would say the words of a televangelist to live our life to the fullest. To be holy. Peter guy, Peter's Guidelines starts out with a challenge to go deep. In verse 13 it says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Christ is revealed. The King James Version puts it a little different. I really like how it, it says this. It says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird is a great word, right? It's not one we hear too often anymore, but it gives us a sense of action, right? For the Roman soldier in that day, back in Peter's day as he's writing this, girding was essential in battle. They wore long tunics and robes, and to rush into battle in a long tunic or robe, your feet are covered and your legs are covered, and you can't move freely. You could get intertwined, wrapped up in that robe. So as they prepared for battle, they would take their, their robes, they would gird them up in a belt, and they would cinch it tight so that they had freedom to move in battle, that they were protected. And with their clothes, they didn't have to worry about tripping or getting entangled during the battle. So we are to prepare our minds, right? Gird up our minds. R.C. Sproul in his commentary on 1 Peter says this, We are living in a period of church history that may be classified as mindless. It is not an anti-intellectual period of church history. It's not anti-scientific or anti-technological or even anti-educational, but anti-mind. We as Christians have been taught to check our minds out at the door or maybe even leave them at home but thinking is a vital part of our faith. And that's repeated throughout Scripture. Ephesians 4, verse 23 says this, To be made new, new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and, hope, and hope, hope, holiness. So that attitude of your mind being replenished, re replaced, a new mind. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, it says this. Brothers, stop thinking like children in regard, in regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. So there's that process of, as we, if we are to be holy, we have to be thinking, we have to be understanding, and we aren't just infantile in that process. And way back in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, the, it says this, Isaiah 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. So we even have the Lord 
saying in the Old Testament, come, let us reason, let us think about these things. The mind and thinking are funny things, right? We can overthink things. I do it all the time. I sit and I go over and over in my mind thinking, should have I said that? Should have I? Should I do this? Should I do that? But if we start to overthink, if we start to rely just on our knowledge and understanding, we can become cold and impersonal. It's a process where we think that we know more than others and that seeking knowledge is the key to life and the more I know, the better I understand, but I kind of start pushing everybody else out of the way. I start thinking that they don't know as much as me, so I can't talk or interact with them. And so we push relationships aside and become impersonal. I'm sure you can maybe think of people or examples in your own life. But when we don't think, we get in a situation like this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 2. And it says this, For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. So there becomes this passion, this power to do, but the knowledge is lacking there, and so the zeal is what you go on. Eichmann had zeal, right? It was said that part of his passion that drove him was because so many around him had knowledge and schooling and the degrees and were educated men, and that he didn't have those. So his zeal burned to be better than them. He had zeal but no knowledge according to what he should. See, growing up in a Protestant family, no matter if he went to church a lot, if he didn't hardly go to church at all, he would have known what he was doing was wrong. Yet his zeal burned and controlled him. Peter points out in this passage that vigorous exercise of the mind is important. We should not get to the point where we become impersonal or that our zeal burns without knowledge. But without thinking, we are less human, right? To be holy, to strive to be more like God, we need knowledge and good judgment. Psalm 119 says this, One nineteen, verse 66. It says this, Before, oh, sorry. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. Teach me knowledge and good judgment. That is part of holiness. When we grow our minds and we dig into God's word, we understand, we know, and we gain judgment. Next, Peter tells us to be non-conforming. In verse, 10, verse 14, it says, Obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We know that we are sojourners in this world, right? We're aliens, we're travelers. This is not our home. We've heard it in Hebrews, when we study Hebrews, we hear it now in 1 Peter. And because we're aliens, we are called to live differently than the rest of the world. In Romans 12, Paul says this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. Do not be conformed to this world. It's a little easier said than done, right? When we look around and we stop and we think, is the church influencing the world or is the world influencing the church? That speaks a lot about the people in the pews and the person standing up front in the church today. We have to stop living 
Like this world is all we have to live for. Eichmann conformed to this world in a wholehearted way. He took it to the extreme. He wanted to be in power. He wanted the money. He wanted the fame. He wanted everything that went with it. And in the Nazi party, he gained a whole lot of that. He was living for every ounce of this world that he could. And we as Christians need to stop prioritizing the things of this called us to do. I heard a preacher put it this way once. You want to know where your priority is? Look at what you're doing in your free time. Some of us have a lot of that right now. And what does your checkbook say? Where is the money going? It's not easy to make that choice to be non-conforming. We have to daily make decisions to not conform to this world. And when we do that, when we choose not to conform, when we choose to follow God's word instead of what the world wants us to do, then we become a light that shines for Jesus. In verse 15 it says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Holiness. I would love to say I have something here for Eichmann that fits in and <laughs> works, but there was nothing holy about this man. Right? Nothing holy at all. But this idea of holiness has fallen by the wayside in the church. In our mindless culture, the church has stopped reminding people of the fact that we need to be holy. Living out our faith is so much more than filling a pew for 45 minutes one day a week. But this is not a new thought in the Bible. All the way back in Levitic Leviticus 20, Verse 26, it says this, You are to be holy to me, because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. In the New Testament, it's everywhere. The book of Titus, 2 Corinthians 7.1, says, let us, be, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates our body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. And we'll get to it in the coming weeks, but 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And Ephesians 5, 3. But among you there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Holiness for God is that His children reflect His character. For us to truly live a holy life, we need to emulate the Father. It's a hard thing. Right? We talked earlier about a mind thing, now it's a heart thing. We need to promise the things of this world. Right, The aspect of holiness is not something that God wants us to try and accomplish. It's not something that He wants us to give our best effort for. He doesn't say, Joshua, try your hardest at this and I'm okay with that. It is a requirement of following God. Be holy because I am holy. Holiness is evidence that we have a personal relationship with Him. That we want to be like Him. If Christ is in our lives, then we should see a change in our lives and a longing to be more like Christ now. I would even go so far as to say that if you do not have a longing to be more like Christ or to be holy, then you might not have that relationship that you think you have.
Because we were called to be holy in every aspect of our life. John Piper said this, Holiness is the condition of the heart in which God is our greatest happiness. Peter in verses 17 through 21 calls us to reverence. Since you call on a father who judges each man's works impartially, live your life as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed, for the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in those last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your Father and hope are in God. A reverent fear of the Lord. This is not the fear that I have when I walk through our yard that I'm going to run into a snake somewhere. As I step out that back door, there's going to be one waiting there in the sun. Right? It's not the fear of the unknown or anything like that. Adolf Eichmann lived in fear. He had to constantly be looking over his shoulder for the things he had done. At the end of the war, he was able to sneak his way to South America, but the whole time he lived there, he had to constantly be wondering, worrying, is someone going to come for me because of the things I've done? He feared getting caught and found out. But that is not how a life should be lived. As children of God, we should have a reverent fear. Luther called it a filial fear. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but I'm going with that. He compared it to a child who has tremendous respect and love for his father and mother and who dearly wants to please them. We are just travelers, aliens, here on this earth waiting for the day that Jesus returns. And we should keep a holy fear in our eyesight as we wait for him to come. Nehemiah 1.11 says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Our fear should draw us to the Lord. A holy, reverent fear should draw us closer to Him. Verses 18 and 21, the second half of that part I read, reminds us that we should be drawn to the Lord, much like a child has respect and love for his parents. Because it is not of the things of this earth that we were redeemed. We have been bought back with a price. Not just anything has bought us back. It was the precious blood of Christ. Peter chooses an interesting word here, right? He uses precious to show the value that was paid for us. Ordinary things are not precious. We had precious to things like gems and jewels, things that we hold in high value. That's really precious to me. That blood that was in the most, that blood that was shed is the most valuable thing ever to be on this earth. Nothing else could have redeemed us. That should, that thought, that process should help us have a reverent fear for God. You may be thinking, why Adolf Eichmann in this message? as we've been going through this and after the beginning. I used his story for this one part, and it fits well. In 1960, Adolf Eichmann was captured in Argentina by Israeli forces. He was brought back to Israel to stand trial for his crimes against humanity and the Jewish nation. It was a fairly controversial thing. And at the trial, one of the witnesses named Yael Dinur, who had been sent to a prison camp by Eichmann, took the stand. 
As Danur took the stand, he began to sob uncontrollably. He then fainted and collapsed in a heap on the floor as the presiding judicial officer pounded his gavel to regain order in the courtroom. In an interview after the trial, Dunur explained what took place in that moment. He explained that all at once he realized Eichmann was not the godlike army officer who had sent him and so many others to their deaths. Or sent so many others to their death, not Dunur. That Eichmann was an ordinary man. And Dunur said, I was afraid about myself. I saw that I am capable to do this. I am exactly like him. This is the reality of sin in the hearts of everyone who tries to live their life in the pattern of evil and oppression in this world. No matter if it's extreme or a little bit, if we head down that path of doing our will and what we want to do, that's the reality of sin. But holiness means that that pattern is broken. That the sinner is transformed. God becomes the model to follow and our lives are repatterned after Him. So let us gird up the loins of our mind. Think about the call of God to His children. Children that have been redeemed by the precious blood that they may walk not as the world, but as redeemed children of God. Let's pray.